Good morning. Welcome to worship at, at Sterling United Methodist Church. It's good to see you all here. We have some exciting things happening. As you can see, we have the taco truck out in our, on the front. And we are, I hope you're all um, excited about participating in the avocado adventure, which will begin at 10 o'clock and going on till two in the afternoon. And also there is a avocado contest. So if you've, if you've uh, participated and has it, have an entry, I hope things go well for you. If you look in the wire this week, you will see a QR code. And um, the QR code invites us to partake of a short survey. So I hope that you will um, add that to your phone and uh, answer the survey. And what we also need is, as we have the garden out in the back, we need waterers and we need um, harvesters. So if you have some time, please uh, make an effort to help water or harvest the crop. Um, and I also wanna thank all of you for uh, all of you who made last Sunday's remembrance of Steve Vineyard a time of remembering and a time of connecting. So thank you all very much for your presence and your support and uh, the ways that you um, made this whole, that whole morning uh, a wonderful experience and I know the family was very grateful and appreciative, so thank you all. Please rise and join me in the spoken call to worship. Friends, let us worship today with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. Let us consider how to encourage one another to love and good deeds. Praise the Lord. Amen. Please remain standing for hymn number 126. Sing praise to God who reigns.
please remain standing and join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. In the stillness of your presence, O oh God, we feel you filling us from within, illuminating our minds, warming our hearts, stirring our spirits, strengthening our hand outstretched, transforming our lives until every fiber of our being is filled with your presence. Through your presence, help us to be sensitive to the needs around us to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, clothing the naked, visiting those who are sick and in prison, welcoming the stranger. By this, Lord, they will know that we are your children by the love we share with our neighbor. Lord, we live in an uncertain world and we pray for your strength and guidance. We pray your wisdom on the world's leaders. We pray for your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for our church and for its leaders. Lord, we need your guidance and your direction for us as a church. We want to be faithful to the sacred trust you have given to us. Lord, there are many among us today with special needs in their own lives and who are in need of your healing touch and reassurance right now. And so, Lord, we pray for Jill and Ave, Bobby, Todd, Betty, Marlene, and Jerry. We lift up to you Lynn and Herb, Austin, John, Ray, Margaret, Ellen, and Virginia. Continue to make your presence known to May and Stella, Denise, Oliver, Lorraine, Trish, Carol, and John. And Lord, we pray for... Tim and Ellie Morrow and their family as they grieve the death of Tim's mother, Bridget. 
So Lord, continue to surround those with your healing presence and your loving care. Lord, we pray for men and women serving in the military, often from home. We pray for their safety and well-being. We pray for their families at home who support them with their love, how they reach out and always sh showering their prayers. Lord, we lift up in silence others who are on our hearts. Blessed are you, God of all life, you who rejoice in our worship, who attends to the cry of the needy, who offers hope in the midst of hard times, and who fills us with your grace. Lord, we're grateful for that grace that fills us with your love, your peace, your hope, and your light that we hope shines out from our lives, and that you also continue to share that light with others. We pray all this in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are grateful for the many ways that you have shared your gifts and graces in, at Sterling United Methodist Church. And I want to say thank you again for the wonderful support and encouragement and time that you spent in making last Sunday's um, celebration and uh, remembrance of a wonderful event. So thank you all very much. We, it is a joy to uh, receive and it is a joy to give. And as you want to share uh, a portion of what God has given to you, I invite you to either as you come forward for Holy Commu for Communion, uh, to place it in one of the one of the offering plates, or as you leave the worship service at the end of the service, uh, again, place it in the offering plate. And again, we thank you for your generosity.
Today's scripture lesson is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 7 through 13. Jesus sends out the twelve. Calling the twelve to him, excuse me, Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. And I'm still missing it. I apologize. (laughs) Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that house. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. The word of God for the people of God. God. Heavenly Father, too often we travel through life with excess baggage. What we really need to do is trust in you and travel lightly. Let the word shared today be a guide to the way we should approach others in the world. Amen. Summer is a time when people typically take vacation. And sometimes that vacation, the mode of travel for that vacation, is going by car. So I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been traveling by car and you begin to feel hungry? Perhaps the snacks that you had packed have already been eaten. And it'll be a while before you arrive at any other food place. If you're traveling with children, however, the need to find a food source can become paramount. I believe there's a correlation between the hunger felt by your passengers and the amount of complaining you'll hear from the back seat or even the passenger seat. Depending on where you're traveling, you may come across some fast food restaurants fairly quickly, or you could be looking out the window for miles and miles and miles and see only landscape, no edible food. At that point, as tummies feel hungrier, moods become irritated, and you pray that a McDonald's and those golden arches will appear soon. I wonder if Jesus' followers asked Jesus questions like, where are we going today? And along the way begin to complain, are we there yet? I'm hungry. Where are we going to eat? Jesus and his disciples were traveling among villages, and Jesus called the twelves and named them apostles. Apostles meaning sent ones. And he sends them out two by two. Jesus also gives them authorities over unclean spirits. And Jesus has also given his followers the authority to expel demons and to preach the good news of the kingdom. Jesus gives them power to undermine the power of evil during their mission. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts. Galilee was dotted with many small villages, and Jesus' followers will travel a lot if they hope to speak to many people. So they travel light. It is a significant commitment to travel to and live in a country you've never seen, to live among people with whom you may not initially have a lot in common, and to have to learn their customs and to discover what matters to them. Many years ago, my uncle, a Presbyterian pastor, and his wife served in South America as missionaries for a while. And that was during the 1970s, and I imagine it took time to build relationships, to establish trust, in hopes that people receive the good news of Jesus Christ into their lives. As Jesus gets ready to send these disciples off to share the good news, Jesus' instructions permit disciples adequate clothing, but not a second tunic which would have provided protection from the cold night air. Rather, 
Jesus wanted them to trust God to provide them with lodging each night. And think about it. If you're staying in someone's house, you begin to get to know them and you begin to build a relationship. The disciples were not permitted to carry money or extra provisions from one place to another. The disciples could not engage in preaching and healing in order to make money, which could have subjected him to, subjected them to the charge of being religious charlatans or magicians. The disciples were to de depend on local hospitality. Since they were required to remain in the first house that welcomed them, they could not move to a household that offered more luxurious accommodations. His followers had to rely on the hospitalities of those with whom they visited and that they, were and that they are receiving even as they are giving the gospel to the people. Jesus counsel that they stay in one home per village is probably not about accepting a better offer, which would risk dishonor and foster envy and competition among the villagers. It is rather about establishing relationships so that people will become familiar with Jesus' followers and learn to trust in the good news that they shared. Jesus also gives guidance for what to do if they aren't welcome or if they're not being heard. They are to shake off the dust that is on their feet as a testimony against those who would not welcome them. We may ask why anyone would not welcome healing, a new way of seeing repentance. The arrival of God's kingdom changes the world as we know it. For some, that kind of change is a threat to the status quo, and people can be adverse to changes. The charge to travel light and to accept whatever accommodations are offered is a call to Christians to simplify their lives and to trust God completely. The text invites you and I to a life of simplicity, a life of trust in and obedient to the one who for our sake became poor, so that by his poverty we might gladly strip ourselves of the clutter of things that would rob us of the authenticity as Jesus' followers. The disciples do not become independent of Jesus. The teachings and healings that they perform are extensions of Jesus' own ministry. All ministry in the church recognizes the obligation to continue Jesus' work of preaching, healing, teaching, the ministry and person of Jesus Christ. This con continuation of Jesus' work is a call that you and I receive to this day. The earliest Christians recognized the need to adapt the circumstances in which they found themselves. The gospel comes to bring healing and peace and good news to people. And it means that missionaries, you and I, must adapt to the culture to a certain extent of those that we have come to serve. The problem with baggage is that Jesus would be happier if we took nothing more than the clothes on our back for our journey. Most of us have some kind of baggage that travels with us even when we think we're taking nothing on the journey. But there are a couple of helpful things that we can note from this account of Jesus' sending out his disciples. While Jesus tells his disciples to take nothing for the journey, he never tells them not to wear clothes. They are to be vulnerable, but not that vulnerable. They can still do the work to which he calls them. They are still able to cast out demons and heal the sick. Jesus' followers were working for him. Jesus finished a day in which he cast out spirits and healed the sick, which Jesus had done to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took our affirmities and bore our diseases. And the disciples cast out those spirits, taking on the infirmities and anointing with oil those who are sick, 
bearing our diseases. We Christians may be tempted to label some of our hang-ups as sins, and some may be, but we don't need to be so quick to go there. The person who has too high of an opinion of himself may be guilty of the sin of pride, but the one who flaunts his abilities may not be proud at all. He may have such a low self-esteem that his apparent pride is actually an attempt to hide how worthless he feels. And what he suffers is not sin, but baggage. And what he needs is not forgiveness, but healing. The baggage of guilt can weigh us down. So what can we do about our baggage in order to lighten the load on our hearts? Ask God to help us face our problems squarely and without rationalization. Admit to God the specific reaction that interferes with our relationship and relationships and keep us from being fruitful. Decide what we need to do to keep some of the memories that keep resurfacing in our minds from weighing us down. One author talked about accepting responsibility. It can be helpful to look back on how our idiosyncrasies have originated. What were the circumstances in my past that have contributed to the shaping of my current personality? And it's significant to admit that regardless of how we got to where we are, We're responsible for dealing with it in the now and for working to become the whole person that God intends us to be. Jesus wants us to pray, to lay the problem before God in prayer. This does not mean that such things as counseling, support groups, or psychotherapy are not helpful. Rather, they are often the first line of help. But talking to God about the scars we bear is often a significant part of the healing process. And then let Jesus handle the baggage. A preacher and writer, David Siemens, tell the story in his book, Healing for Damaged Emotions, and tells about a woman named Betty. Betty's mother and father were not married when she was conceived. In fact, her parents only married because of the pregnancy, and neither parent really wanted a child. When Betty was three and a half, her father walked out. Even though she was young, she remembered the final argument between her parents and the moment when her father left for good. For her, it was a terrifying moment, and it left an aching core of pain in her heart. As an adult... Betty became a Christian and married a Christian man, but they experienced difficulties in their relationship, in part due to Betty's continuing depression. Betty went to see her pastor and, in counseling, told him about her painful memory of her father leaving and how she felt abandoned. Her pastor asked her to spend some time pondering and praying about the question, where was God at the moment of your conception? This seemed a little weird to Betty, but she took the assignment seriously, and on the third day, she thought about a question. She suddenly began to cry, and and an image occurred to her of how God was there loving not only her at her conception, but how God was loving her at every moment of her life. And it was the beginning of her ability to be able to handle her baggage and start the repair of her marriage. There are times when Jesus' instruction to take nothing with us ought to be obeyed literally. It's an opportunity for you and I to leave whatever baggage we are carrying behind. Jesus invites us to take care regarding the things we hang on to, like some memories or resentments, those times when we failed our feeling of guilt, our worries, our fears, and pray we can let them go. And once gone, these are not to be picked up again, rather continued forward in the presence of God, realizing God's great love for you and I. 
Allow yourself to take those burdens of guilt and worries and fear and place them in God's hands. Jesus never intended for our hearts to be weighed down. Instead, Jesus desires that we let God fill the void we've created as we let go of those negative feelings in life and let God instead fill that void with love and hope and joy and peace and God's presence and God's forgiveness. And that is traveling joyfully light and joyfully free. May it be so. Let us pray. Almighty and loving God, we thank you for the many ways that you have made your presence known to us. So Lord, we pray that you know what is on each and every one of our hearts and minds. So Lord, for those of us who can carry burdens and keep reviewing them over and over in our minds, Lord, help us to finally take those burdens in our own hands and place them in your hands and enable us to live free from guilt and fear and doubt and worry and embrace your spirit of love, peace, hope, and joy. In your son's name we pray, amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Holy is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. 
gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. It is the practice of the United Methodist Church to celebrate an open communion table. And what that means, if the desire of your heart is to draw closer to Jesus Christ, then you are invited and welcome to the table. The ushers will guide you to the table.
May we pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. from this place, we go in the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior, and always in communion with God's Spirit, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to enjoy a taco. <laughs> Amen. 